The Tyranids are the newest arrival to the galaxy, having struck from beyond the Milky Way in several waves known as High Fleets. Their numbers are dizzying, with seemingly endless organisms enslaved to the will of the hive mind and spawned on command, but there is also a great diversity in the organisms seen across the galaxy's battlefields. We've seen so many different creatures that it would be near impossible to catalogue them all, but near impossible means nothing to me, and I want to ensure that the galaxy is better warned about what's coming for them. In this log in particular, I wish to explore one subgroup of the Tyranids, trying to bulk out and complete one section of their bestiary in tandem with other logs, both past and future. These are the most infamous powerhouses of the Great Devourer, the monstrous creatures, and the bio-titans of the Tyranids. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to Full Decay Stories. As with our log on the Demonic Legions recently, this log will probably come across a little disjointed, but bear with me, I want to make sure we're all on the same page about the basics of the Tyranids before we dive into details. The Tyranids are a Xenos race from somewhere beyond the galaxy, having travelled through the void of space between galaxies for an indeterminate amount of time and arriving in around 750M41. They were named after the first planet they were encountered on known as Tyran, and it is believed they were drawn to the galaxy by the destruction of the Pharos Beacon in the Horus Heresy. Several other High Fleets have followed since the original High Fleet Behemoth from different entry points across the galaxy, most famously Kraken and Leviathan, but with many others such as Gorgon and Kronos. What drives the hive mind that controls the Tyranids is unclear, but its minion's singular goal in existence is to consume everything in their path as a means of fulfilling the fleet's continued travel and quote-unquote conquest. You see, the Tyranids are not empire builders in the same way as almost every other major race we know, as they leave nothing behind on the worlds they conquer. And I do mean nothing. Every bit of biomass, every mineral fragment, even the atmosphere itself is all consumed and transported to the bioships of the high fleets. All their technology is biological in case you didn't know, and all this stuff acts as fuel as well as everything else. Using that fuel and the broken down biomass of the organisms used to wipe out the defenders, the Tyranids sustain themselves for their next journey as they find a new world or foe to consume. If it has its way, the hive mind will probably consume absolutely everything in the galaxy and leave the Milky Way as a barren pile of rocks before moving on to wherever it is that they go next. Theories abound as to why the Tyranids left their original galaxy as well as their origins in general. Some believe that they have left one or more galaxies barren in their wake before and the Milky Way just happens to be a meal that caught their attention due to the Pharos or perhaps the Astronomicon. Others instead have a more scary theory, that the Tyranids were driven from their home galaxy by another, more powerful race or entity, fleeing from something even more dangerous than they are that may well just be chasing them down, they eat so they can run. There is even a wild suggestion that the Tyranids were never technically from another galaxy at all. According to some, the species was created by the former rulers of the Milky Way, the ancient race known aptly as the Old Ones. Why? As a last resort countermeasure designed to wipe the galaxy clean if it ever needed it. Personally, I don't buy into that. We haven't really got evidence outside of what is basically conspiracy theory. But who knows, the old ones did make the orcs supposedly, so it's not like they hadn't got form. As mentioned already, the Tyranids are ruled and controlled by a hive mind, a singular intelligence that dominates all under its sway and seemingly projects a shadow in the warp that disrupts psychic communications. The dominance over any Tyranid being in range is total, but to ensure that it stays that way, every army is anchored at several key places by organisms known as synapse creatures. These beasts act as nodes and amplifiers for the psychic dominion of the hive mind that controls the Tyranids. If they are slain, it can prove devastating in the short term by disrupting communication and forcing the lesser intellects to resort to instinctive behaviour instead of the plan. In our previous logs, we've explored some of the organisms found in the Tyranid swarm. In terms of things on the level we're exploring today, we looked at the Swarm Lord, the most powerful known hive tyrant, as well as exploring the Khan effects and its almost legendary variant, Old One-Eye. 
However, we didn't explore the tyrant in full, and there are many more beasts on a similar and larger scale to it and the Carnifex. So, let's start exploring. Since we already mentioned one of its greatest incarnations, let's begin with the leader beasts of the Great Devourer's Hordes, the Hive Tyrant. These creatures are the most capable warriors and generals available to the hive mind, as you would almost certainly expect given almost every organism is spawned and designed for a very specific role. Whether fighting with a dizzying array of biomorphs from melee or range across its four limbs, or using its almost unparalleled synaptic dominance to direct the tyranid onslaught, hive tyrants are never, ever to be trifled with. And as if that wasn't enough, they are very capable psychers as well, often messing with the minds of their victims as much as killing them outright. Some hive tyrants are even spawned with a giant pair of leathery wings as well, sacrificing some of their damage output, but gaining incredible speed that allows a quicker response to any situation. However, what makes a hive tyrant truly unique and dangerous isn't any of its physical attributes or even its synaptic power as one of the greatest conduits of the hive mind seen on the battlefield. No, the unique quality of these creatures is their freedom from the micromanagement of the hive mind. Hive tyrants are controlled but self-aware, whereas most tyrannids are synaptically dominated. They're blessed with an intellect that makes them excellent strategists and an adaptive ability that means very few tacticians can beat them for long. No problem, you may say, just kill the tyrant and then the swarm is left disoriented and easy pickings. Well, just ask Oshova how that one goes. It might work short term, but even picking off all the leader bees present won't help for long for a couple of reasons. The first is that there are many more synapse creatures, both large and small, across the Tyranids, so the maintenance of the synaptic control will not be difficult for the hive mind to engineer, even if it can't perhaps counter strategize quite as effectively for a bit. The second is how the hive tyrants interact with the hive mind, being linked to it in such a way that their entire personality and memory is stored by the Great Devourer. This means that should the hive tyrant fall in battle, the hive mind effectively loses nothing. Sure, it doesn't have that freer mind on the battlefield for a bit to direct traffic, and sure, the disruption of its death might cause some heavy losses for a time, but a new one can always be spawned with all the knowledge and experience of its predecessor and the smarts to learn from its mistakes. Granted, only the Swarm Lord itself is supremely gifted when it comes to outthinking and new plans, but every other tyrant is still very capable at adapting and is not to be trifled with intellectually. And all of this, of course, assumes you can actually kill the thing in the first place. Between its psychic powers, its varied weapons, and its hardened carapace, it's no easy feat to put a hive tyrant down at range or up close. The flying variants are another problem on top since, you know, they're flying. But even those on foot are not the easiest to get to, even if they're not just surrounded by a living carpet of lesser organisms. On some occasions, the hive mind will assign medium-sized beasts known as Tyrant Guard to, well, guard the tyrant. These things are hugely bulky and all but inured to pain, with the bare minimum of intellect to perform their bodyguard functions. Blind and instead controlled as extensions of the tyrant's will and body, some suspect that the Tyrant Guard were first created after the Tyranids encountered the Space Marines. The Imperium would vehemently deny it as heresy and all other sorts of nonsense, but the fused rib cage, the carapace, it might mean something, though I wouldn't want to say for certain, and I don't really think there's a tyrannid archivist who tells us when everything was made. There is also a seemingly unique hive tyrant seen most often in the region called the Jericho Reach, known as the Dagon Overlord of, well, High Fleet Dagon. Quite whether this is a truly unique design like the Swarm Lord created for a certain purpose is unknown, but the Overlord does seem to stand aside from other Hive Tyrants with its abilities and perhaps even its mindset. Like much of that Hive Fleet, the Overlord is toxic with fluid leaking from its carapace, but it also projects an aura of madness more powerful than expected that can send friend and foe into a murderous frenzy. It also consumes some of those on the battlefield against it, directing lesser creatures to gather choice corpses for assimilation or restoration of its own form. 
The Death Watch have spent a fair amount of time trying to decipher exactly how the Overlord works for their own records if nothing else, but the Hive Tyrant seems to have caught on and apparently has a particular fervour when hunting down a kill team. One of the other leader beasts on a similar scale to the Hive Tyrant is one I've mentioned very briefly in a previous log, the Turvigon. This isn't really a general in the same sense as the Hive Tyrant is, as it lacks that freedom and intelligence required to really command an army beyond being a synapse creature that you can project the Hive Mind's will through. However, it does exert a special command over one type of Tyranid in particular, the basic ranged infantry known as Termagants. In fact, the Turvagon is a secondary spawning system for the Gaunts that can incubate and create them on the fly. This is obviously useful if you just need a few more bodies to drown your enemies in, but its main purpose isn't for the battlefield, but instead for the interstellar voyages made by the bioships of the Tyranid fleets. Unlike most Tyranids which are broken down to biomass during the journeys through deep space, the Turvagons remain alive and awake as guardians of the bioships. If they detect an invader, they will spawn and coordinate a termagant assault in combination with their weak psychic abilities, repulsing the weakest of invaders whilst also buying time for the ships to spawn more powerful tyranids as required. However, this closer link to the Gaunts does come with a downside, as the death of a Turvagon will cause a synaptic backlash that kills many of the termagants near to it, potentially opening a hole in tyranid lines for a wily commander to exploit. Moving on, let's look at creatures more similar to the monstrous creature known as the Carnifex that we discussed in our previous log. The Carnifex is a little smaller than most of these beasts, but the sort of general design cues as well as their intellect is probably on a similar level, so we'll use it as a segue because it's my log and I can do that. Probably the natural step up from the Carnifex, at least if you're wanting a gun on legs without much brain, is the organism known as the Tyrannofex. Built like a heavily armoured Turvagon, but trading the incubators for a ginormous gun, the Tyrannofex is a walking fortress armed with one of three ranged biomorphs designed for different purposes. Whether shredding infantry with flesh borer hives in its legs, or mounting a tank cracking rupture cannon, the Tyrannofex is a real problem to deal with, and even getting up close to neutralise it is problematic thanks to its short range secondary biomorphs. And should you actually manage to close it and get through said biomorphs, the Tyrannofex is also designed to emit stress pheromones if engaged in melee, attracting more close quarter oriented Tyranids in order to bail it out of the jam. There is another organism who can destroy its enemies at range that fits into this size category, but unlike the Tyrannofex, it doesn't come with a huge biomorph gun to do it. This creature is the Maliceptor, supposedly the purest embodiment of the psychic power of the hive mind. And whilst it doesn't fight anywhere near as well as a Hive Tyrant, nor have that critical freedom of thought we mentioned earlier, it is still a capable general due to its high intelligence and processing capacity. Maliceptors aren't blind, but incredibly psychic powerful, projecting the shadow in the warp more forcefully than any other organism and dealing out huge amounts of damage whilst also being aware of the tyrannids around them due to their synaptic links and psychic perception. They treat the battlefield as a neural network of sorts, with each lesser tyranid a source of information and their own psychic power to further improve the data. And this allows Maliceptors to respond and command those tyranids around them quickly and effectively. Yes, they're not going to orchestrate the conquest of a planet on their own, only a Hive Tyrant has the experience and freedom of strategy for that, but Maliceptors should still be considered as very high priority targets. That said, good luck killing one. Between psychic bowers, Carnifex level armor, the redirection of other organisms into your path, and their common bodyguard of the psychic zone thropes, getting a Maliceptor to go down is no easy feat, but they are thankfully quite rare due to their value to the hive mind. Whilst Maliceptors could be seen as heavy armored and more powerful versions of the aforementioned zone thrope, though there is another flying psychic creature known as the Malanthrope that seems to be used for genetic material processing, Another organism of a similar size exists that is probably analogous to something else in a similar way. I speak of the Toxicrine, which is perhaps in some way related to the smaller, spore-emitting Venomthropes often used to shroud advancing Tyranid forces. Whilst the Venomthropes are unpleasant and annoying, 
The toxicrine is something else. Its tendrils and tentacles make it very problematic in melee to fight, but it is their spore clouds that prove the greatest threat to both their close-up enemies and the planet as a whole. The spores themselves don't just float around after being released from the chimneys on a toxicrine's back, as they have a small but dangerous sentience that attacks the bodies of those unfortunate enough to be exposed. They can penetrate through the most robust of filters or protective equipment, wherein they absorb the moisture of their victims to expand in size and kill the infected. Often accompanied by venomthropes to ensure an even thicker spore cloud for protection, Toxicrines are often not found in the initial wave of a Tyranid onslaught, but rather arrive when the hive mind deems it time for the planet's harvest to begin, though the defenders can still be alive at this point, which explains why some people fight them. They are typically tasked with the infection of the atmosphere via their spore clouds, causing the mild terraforming that is typical of a Tyranid invasion to maximise the biomass absorbed in the harvest. Finally, for the Carnifex-like creatures, let's look at something a little more bipedal than the Carnifex appears to be, and with a much more singular task. You may not have heard of the organism known as the Dimacheron, but if you're a commander on the battlefield, and in particular a gifted and inspiring one, you need to be aware and probably afraid of this thing. The Dimacheron is the hunter-killer of the hive mind, sent to kill specific targets in order to break the foe's morale. It can travel great distances at frightening speeds, leaping tanks without effort in order to close with its victim. Once there, its array of claws and talons can make swift work of whatever happens to be in its way, whilst its maw can be unhinged in order to impale and then break down victims to heal the Dimacheron, which likely took a lot of fire on the way to its prey. In the size class of the Carnifex, but designed totally differently, there are a few organisms that share a common root, that being the serpentine raveners that we also discussed in a previous log. The creatures in question are known as the Trigon and the Morlock, though there is a little more to the former than just the baseline. All of them are experts at burrowing underground to strike from an unexpected quarter, but with very different goals when they actually do surface. The Trigon is a tunnel digger that allows smaller organisms to follow in its wake, whilst the Morlock will literally emerge beneath the foe to devour them as it emerges to the surface. The Trigon carves out vast labyrinthine tunnels as it burrows beneath enemy lines, seemingly using the bioelectric charge it creates from its carapace to create a glassy layer that seals it against collapse. This allows many groups of smaller Tyranids to use the tunnel after the Trigon has emerged, opening up an entirely new front in the battle that can overwhelm enemy forces due to being surrounded from all sides. This bioelectric charge can also be used offensively to attack enemies, but if you want to see it at its full potential, then let me point you to the nastier cousin of the Trigon. Known as the Trigon Prime, this creature has a greater bioelectric attack thanks to what are known as containment spines, but its greatest advantage over the standard Trigon is that the Prime is actually a synapse creature. This means that no matter where it travels or surfaces, the hive mind will maintain a tight dominion over the Prime and the creatures that use its tunnels, making that second front even better coordinated and thus much more deadly. By contrast, the Morlock is not a synapse creature and there's no such thing as a Morlock Prime, but the giant organism is still incredibly dangerous despite not having the same tunnel digging abilities as the Trigon. In fact, the Morlock really doesn't have a lot going on upstairs if you'll pardon the phrase. It can dig, but that's about it. It's both blind and incredibly simplistic, with almost everything geared toward its burrowing abilities. However, that doesn't mean that there's not some very advanced biology going on with the Morlock, as it is incredibly fast when burrowing and is hypersensitive to the movements of those above it. This allows the Morlock to surface right under the feet of a chosen enemy, using its vast, gaping maw to swallow individuals and maybe even entire squads whole. It isn't all that capable a fighter once it surfaces, but typically the creature will simply dive back underground once again instead moving on to find new prey to devour, or just coming back under the foe that it just dove under. Now then, let's up the scale a little bit and look at the largest Tyranids not classified as Biotitans. Starting us off, we have the larger cousin to the Tyranifex, the largest artillery beast the Tyranids have, at least to my knowledge. However, 
Whilst this thing called the Exocrine has a much bigger gun than the Tyrannifex, known as a bioplasmic cannon, the beast itself isn't really anything more than a walking platform for said gun rather than actually using it like the Tyrannifex. In truth, all of the intelligence in that symbiosis is in the bioplasmic cannon, and though the Exocrine has to stand still in order to fire at full effectiveness and range, it's a very feared beast under basically all circumstances. On the other end of the scale for engagement distance, there's one of the creatures that could arguably be seen as a quadrupedal version of the Morlock, known as the Haraspex. If you see one of these on the battlefield, then two things are true. One, the Tyranid invasion is heading for its later stages as the world is prepped for consumption, and two, you need to be running as far from it as you can get. The Haraspex was created, like many Tyranids, for a singular purpose, in this case the consumption of absolutely everything in its path, whether dead or alive. Its maw is vast and contains many grasping extensions, allowing it to harvest huge amounts of biomass very quickly and vent the heat of such rapid processing through the spore chimneys on its back. Much like the Morlock, entire squads or even more can be devoured by a Haraspex in short order, and a group of them are supposedly capable of harvesting a battlefield in only a few hours to speed up the consumption of a victim world. And though they don't have infinite capacity, they will simply empty their stomachs into the nearest digestion pool for the high fleet to process before rushing back to its task rather than having to go and jump in a pool, be broken down, be respawned, and then get back to work. There are a bunch of less encountered creatures in this category as well, such as the mollusk-like nautiloid, the different types of hirajule, the spore-launching dactylis, and the tunneling viragon. But probably the last earthbound creature in this size category will be the rather bizarre sporocyst. You rarely see these on the battlefield, as it's something like a giant immobile toxicrine that is responsible for planetary and atmospheric conversion. It burrows partway underground and begins to belch out spores both large and small, altering the atmosphere to prepare it for consumption. Sporocysts don't fight in the conventional sense, but some of their spores are living weapons in themselves that can form potent minefields and floating defences. The largest of these is the mucolid spore, formed from several smaller organisms clustering together, and whilst the smaller spore mines are effective against ground targets, the mucolids are even effective as a form of anti-air. That covers pretty much everything that isn't a biotitan that fights on the ground or under it, aside from one category we'll get to in a moment, so now let's change things again and look to the skies for the varying flying monsters. The first of these is probably the joint smallest to fall into the monstrous category and typically appears early in an invasion alongside smaller winged creatures known as gargoyles that are essentially flying gaunts. It is known as a harpy, primarily due to its rather horrifying shriek, and it is an agile, opportunistic creature that may not survive a protracted dogfight, but is excellent at picking off targets with a hail of fire from its ranged biomorphs, or by dropping spore mines in a flyby. They are void capable, as it happens, though they are almost certainly more at home inside an atmosphere, where their hollow bodies allow them to ride thermals with an agility beyond the most conventional aircraft. That said, a harpy is still effective against weaker ground targets, but struggles somewhat against other flying beasts or craft which either pack more guns or more speed. However, this is the hive mind, and as is typical, there is an organism readily available to fill that void in air-to-air -air combat effectiveness while still being useful against other stuff. This Tyranid is known as the Hive Crone, for reasons unknown to be honest, and it is tasked with securing the skies for a Hive Fleet using its tentaclids, living missiles that unleash a bioelectric pulse on any aircraft that can hunt down. Even when it has expended its tentaclids, the Hive Crone is still a threat. Its maw contains a drool cannon that fires acid onto ground targets, and its belly is covered in bladed protrusions that allow it to rake any aircraft that escape the tentaclids. These spurs are also useful when the Hive Crone is deployed as part of space combat, as it will also engage planetary defence fleets in the exact same manner in order to protect the incoming bioships of the Hive Fleet. There is a larger flying Tyranid though, perhaps the largest atmosphere capable flyer the Hive Fleet has yet created, the Haradan. With a wingspan of nearly 40 metres, the Haradan is impressively large indeed, and it's very fast 
but relies mainly on maneuverability for survival just as the Harpy does due to the fact that most aircraft can go supersonic. Armed with both ranged and melee biomorphs and something of an anti-tank specialism, the swooping dives of a Haradan are something to be feared, but it carries another threat on occasion that makes it problematic for infantry too. The unofficial name for the Haradan is that of Broodmother due to its seeming bond with the gargoyles who we discussed earlier, and though it cannot spawn them, a flock of them can latch onto the belly of the beast in order to be transported over great distances they may not be able to fly themselves. These flocks then detach to wreak their own havoc on the enemy, but the Haradan isn't a synapse creature like the Turbagon, so there's no risk of disruption when it almost inevitably eventually goes down. Actually, only the Hive Tyrant is a synapse creature that can fly as far as I can tell, at least in the monstrous vesture we've discussed today, but this discussion of transporting other lesser organisms is an excellent little segue into our last couple of groups. Though they do not have vehicles of any kind, instead using biological entities in their place, the Tyranids are still capable of creating transporters for their various organisms. The best known of these would be the bioships themselves, of course, as well as the various entities that travel from the ships to the surface of a planet in the early stages of an invasion or to reinforce the swarm. There are two main types of orbital insertion organisms, as I'm going to refer to them, known as mycetic spores and tyrannocytes. The latter of these are arguably more dangerous than the former, as they are fully capable of fighting even after they've delivered their payload of tyranids into the fray, inflating with gas in order to float across the battlefield and shoot with their weapons known as death spitters. On the other hand, the mycetic spore is pretty much designed to die on impact, giving its own life in order to preserve the gaunts or larger organisms that it transports to the surface. They also work in space as a form of boarding craft, and though they often die when they land on their target planet, they can still fight if they survive using melee and even ranged biomorphs. Once down on the surface, there are yet more transport organisms available for the Tyranids, though many of them are very rare indeed, with the exception of the Haradan we already discussed. One of these seems to be a worm or slug-like creature with claws and armour, known as the Malefactor, not to be confused with the psychic Malaceptor we discussed before. It's reportedly rather fast and capable of transporting a brood of lesser Tyranids, but I don't recall any battles involving a Malefactor being deployed as it happens, so I don't really know. I have to say pretty similar things, unfortunately, with regards to the last known transporter, the more beetle-like Cerebor that carries its passengers inside sacks of sorts. I can see why they aren't deployed that often when you have things like the Tyrannocyte and the Mycetic Spore, there's no need to move troops around when you can just break them down and launch some more from the bioships. Even so, it's a shame we know so little, if only so that we'd be better equipped of when they are eventually seen. But now we come to the main event, the true behemoths of the High Fleet, the Bio Titans. And unfortunately, we're not going to have a lot to say here. We don't know as much as I'd like to know. The most important of these, though perhaps not the largest, is the creature known as the Dominatrix. This thing is a rather powerful synapse creature, perhaps even more closely attuned to the hive mind than even the hive tyrants themselves, and the tyrants under its command are led with an impressive tactical sense, even if the tyrant is still probably the better overall tactician. Exactly why the dominatrix is so tightly linked to the hive mind is unclear. Some say that they actually contain a Norn Queen within their hulking bulk, which is why they're so rarely seen given how important Norn Queens are, but exactly because of that importance, the fact that if you kill a Norn Queen you pretty much kill a Hive Fleet, I find it unlikely that that's what makes the Dominatrix tick. Either way, taking one out can have a major effect on a Tyranid invasion, but they're only seen from time to time in the most advanced of Hive Fleets, so it's not a one-size-fits-all plan. If you actually want the largest of the Bio Titans, then I suggest you look around in the archives for the creature known as the Hierophant, or Hierophant, I don't really know how it's pronounced. First encountered on the world of Miral Prime, these lithe yet hulking beasts can weigh in excess of 50 tons, and are often found in the vanguard of a Tyranid invasion. No surprise really, it can probably overwhelm small defending armies all on its own. Some say that the Hierophant is on the level of the Imperial Warlord Titan, 
I haven't witnessed one fighting the other, so I can't be sure, but against many smaller titans, I find it difficult to bet on the Imperial God Machine in that scenario. Whilst the Hierophant mostly seems to focus on ranged combat with massive bio cannons, it's not exactly a slouch up close. Variants have been seen with melee biomorphs, its belly is covered in lashing tendrils, and it constantly emits toxic spores through its carapace as well. In short, if you get stuck on a battlefield with one of these, all I can say as my advice is, hope it doesn't find you. There is another biotitan known as the Vitiator that seems to be on a similar size scale to the Hierophant, but little to nothing is known about it besides its name and some very grainy pick captures, so I have nothing I can really tell you about it, which is a shame, because as much as I sort of probably have plugged this as being all about biotitans, there aren't actually a lot of them, and we don't know a lot about them, probably because no one survives fighting them. Hmm. So there you have it, the monstrous bestiary of the Tyranids, as well as their rather limited array of Biotitans. Truly the hive mind does have a staggering array of creatures under its command, more than even I realised when I started this research, and every single creature mentioned today is one of the largest and most dangerous biological entities you'll encounter out there in the galaxy. Equipped for a wide variety of roles, and specialised to be the apex of their kind, I'm very glad I don't intend to fight them, or even the lesser organisms of the Yehe, any time soon. But for now, we must move on from the Tyranids, though we will be back to complete the bestiary in future. I think next time, we'll dive back into the madness of all things demonic, but not quite leaning into the Legiones Demonica as we did recently. Rather, I wish to explore those followers of Chaos who let demonic power be channeled through them, becoming conduits or even hosts for the entities of the warp. For the moment though, thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.